A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Glad you're with me today. We're going to be talking with John Diedrich of the Milwaukee General Sentinel here in a minute. Uh, You know, John has for over a year now been working on a a series called Behind the Gun that uh, takes a look at gun-related deaths in Wisconsin. What's interesting about what John is doing is that he's actually talking to a lot of gun owners uh, not just gun control advocates. And the pieces that he's come up with, honestly, have been pretty balanced, uh, providing perspective that we don't often see in the mainstream media. Uh, John recently moderated a, a panel discussion, uh, including a lot of gun owners, talking about what can be done to improve public safety without infringing on our right to keep bare arms. So we'll talk with John about that in just a moment. But, uh, boy, it was a busy weekend. I tell you, normally I'm a homebody. <laughs> I don't really leave the uh, the farm all that much, but I had to be up in New Jersey this past weekend for my wife's high school reunion. And so I missed uh, the Friday night order from the Supreme Court uh, denying Maryland's request for a 30-day extension uh, for its response to the cert petition filed in Snope versus Brown. That's the uh, case challenging Maryland's ban on so-called assault weapons. While the Supreme Court did not grant Maryland the full 30-day extension that they were requesting, uh, the court did give Maryland a couple of extra weeks to file their response brief. But it looks like that case is still going to be heard in conference on December 13th, maybe December the 6th, but December 13th looks like it's the more likely date. Uh, If... This case is not relisted, and if the Supreme Court grants cert to Snope versus Brown, that timing would put oral arguments at some point in the spring with a decision handed down, let's say, in late May or June of 2025. If this case does get kicked down the road, right, and they could relist this case, just because it's being heard in conference doesn't mean that they're going to grant cert the first time around. They could relist this for, you know, a couple of extra weeks, and that could push Uh, Even if they uh, ultimately grant cert, that could push the oral arguments back to later in 2025. A decision may be coming out in 2026. I would hate to see that happen, but uh, I I think it's a good sign that they did not agree to Maryland's full 30-day request. And uh, fingers crossed that we do get a a cert grant in Snow versus Brown, um, well, by the end of this year or at least by uh, mid-January 2025. We also saw Tim Walls uh, go hunting this weekend, or at least try to. He did not bag a bird on the opening day of pheasant season. Had strugg- uh, trouble and struggled to uh, load his shotgun, which he said that he had bought uh, sometime before. He didn't say when. <laughs> it was like Kamala Harris doesn't want to talk about when she bought her uh, Glock, allegedly. Uh, but he said that he bought it at a time when he was doing a lot of trap shooting, which is weird because he really struggled to load that shotgun. You would think that uh, someone who's been out there, you know, touting his gun ownership would do a little bit better job, but uh, whatever. I guess it was, um, uh, you know, the media largely covering up the uh, struggles that Tim Walls had, again, uh, portraying this as uh, Tim Walls courting in the Harris-Walls campaign, uh, courting gun owners, courting male voters. I I I don't think that uh, that accomplished This photo op accomplished much of uh, anything in that regard, but it is an incredibly close race right now. And, of course, the uh, Harris and Trump campaigns both doing uh, what they can to try to identify and persuade the dwindling number of undecideds to uh, side with them on Election Day. All right. uh, Let's turn our attention now to our conversation with John Diedrich of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Um, This panel discussion. Probably not surprising to a lot of you. There are a lot of gun owners who says, yeah, you know, listen, we're concerned about people who, you know, are prohibited by law, uh, people who are mentally uh, in trouble, getting a hold of firearms and perhaps using them to commit a violent crime or or using them to take their own life. But the question is, how do we keep those folks safe without infringing on the right to keep and bear arms for everyone else? So let's talk about that with John Diedrich from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Take a look and a listen. John, thanks for coming back on the show. It's good to see you again, sir. Thanks for having me, Cam. Yeah, absolutely. So as part of the Behind the Gun series, um, not only have you been doing a lot of writing, but you've been doing a lot of talking, too, right? I think the last time we had you on the show, there was a a big panel discussion that was held. Um, and then you had was this a was this a specific follow up or was this something uh, that, that was just sort of a, a natural outgrowth of this earlier event? 
Yeah, so what uh, I appreciate you having me back. So that yeah, this project has opened up a bunch of doors uh, for conversations, both um, among people who are interested in firearms issues, uh, gun issues, and then actually also journalists. Um, so it's sort of been twofold. Um, the event that I appeared at last week was specifically uh, a gun violence uh, awareness uh, event and sort of uh, issue uh, uh, day long series, and then. Um, I've also appeared uh, for a number of journalist trainings talking about how to uh, how other journalists could write about gun issues, maybe in a little different way. Well, that's that's good to hear, because um, not to uh, not to, you know, uh, crap on uh, every other journalist out there. But we we, there's a lot of work. I mean, and, and, you know, listen, I was a journal assignment reporter for a couple of years. And every day you are tasked with going out and reporting on stuff that you're certainly not an expert on. Um, and so you want to do that research. You want to do that background so that you don't ask stupid questions and you don't report dumb things, but it can be tough. And I think it's fair to say that there are a lot of reporters out there who don't have a background of gun ownership, uh, and maybe don't have a, that institutional knowledge when it comes to gun issues. Right. Yeah, that's true. And, um, I mean, I, I, and I would say in that category, I, I was in that category for sure and not really aware of it for years. Uh, even though I covered the military, I covered law enforcement, wasn't a wasn't a gun owner. I mean, I'd grown up around guns, but um, this project really getting me in and among gun owners who were willing to take that chance to talk to me has really opened up um some new some new categories and you know i'm always like you know you don't have to be the thing to write about the thing right so i can write about different things that i've never done um it, it and then sometimes that can be a liability if you know too too much about something um you you might not have the fresh eyes um i think the challenge in this is trying to identify language and identify, you know, particularly just like certain phrases that could not be as useful or that might be, um, you know, that might be more, uh, they just need more words to, to define. That's one of the things that I've trained around. And also just, you know, a curiosity. I, I will say one thing that I shared that really has resonated with, with other journalists is I said, you know, rather than jump in in interviews to, you know, how do you stand on this particular issue or what's your thought, you know, could be on any, any side of the issues. What I sort of was, was um, shown was um, just an ability to go a little slower. And my question usually is to talk to people about what's your history with firearms? Like, when did you first get your first gun? Who was it? Who'd you go shooting with? What was it like? Invite me into that story. And I will say that that just opens up whole new categories of conversation rather than jumping right to what's your stance on this hot button issue. You know, I think you're right. Um, and just you know, sort of as, as a side note, it's kind of interesting. You know, obviously, we're, I'm covering the 2024 campaign and Kamala Harris talking about owning a Glock. But, you know, she hasn't told that story. Not that I want to you know, focus on Kamala Harris. I just find it interesting that when, you know, she's brought up her, her ownership of a, a Glock, I think she said in the past, well, she was a prosecutor when she bought the gun. She said, you know, I've, I've got a background in law enforcement. But we haven't heard that story of, OK, here's why I decided to go buy a gun. And I went down to the gun store and here's what it felt like the first time I held that gun. And when I went to the range, Um Again, I'm not going to ask you to weigh in on that, but I, I have found it very interesting that because you're right. That's one of my favorite questions to ask people is how did did you you know, what what's your story? Right. Did you grow up around guns? Did this was something that you know happened to you as an adult? And there is generally a, a a compelling story, even if it's. Yeah. You know, I just grew up and this was the most natural thing in the world. My parents taught me. My grandparents took me hunting. Um, I find it interesting that we haven't heard Kamala Harris's story, but. But you are exploring, again, those stories of some of these gun owners in Wisconsin. So tell me about this latest event, because I saw the uh, the headline from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and this was not the story that you wrote. Um, this is one of your colleagues talking about, uh, you know, yes, uh, let me make sure I got the, uh, the headline in front of me here. Um, gun owners support steps to improve safety. The challenge is how, right? And I think that that is maybe, again, an eye-opener for some reporters that, oh, it's not that gun owners love their guns more than kids. It's not that gun owners don't care about violence. We do. 
right? The, the debate is over how do we address violent crime? How do we address suicide with firearms while at the same time protecting our right to keep and own firearms? Yeah, so this event um, was headlined uh, 80% coalition. Um, that name comes from some polling around specific issues. Those issues are uh, background check storage and um, red flag laws. And so the context of the event was really what um, might be s sort of a, a, a classic series of speakers that were going to talk about these efforts to achieve these three goals. And I received a reach out from the organizer of it, Daryl Moran, who himself is a gun owner. And he said, John, I, I put together or I want to do a panel of gun owners, which isn't always the case in events of this sort. Um, and, you know, he said, I want I'm having some challenge trying to find people. I said, well, I can I, I've talked to people for this project. So I reached out to a few people and they were happy to do it. And um, they knew, you know, kind of coming into the waters that they're coming into, that there would be, uh, you know, more of a gun suspicious to a gun negative sort of sense that there might be in the room. Um, you know, some gun friendly too, but maybe, you know, but it just, it, it ran the range in terms of some of the content, but all three of these individuals, and they were all men, I really had hoped a woman would come on and it just didn't work out with the scheduling. But these three uh, guys who came on, uh, Jair Vance, uh, William Olivier and uh, Jeff Ferris, I've interviewed for this project. So I had the advantage of knowing their story a little bit, different backgrounds. So Jeff grew up an engineer, uh, more um, in a classic hunting setting, and Jair and, and William both grew up in the city, both African-American, Jeff's white, so a little bit different background. But I think, so we did this panel, and um, what I tried to do was, first of all, um, and, and this was one of the big, I think, reveals of the project, and, and to just to what you spoke to, is that gun owners very much do care about these issues. And to suggest otherwise, even in an unconscious way, is... Um, um, it's just the wrong way to go because it because it right away sets people on edge, which is something like this, like, well, uh, you know, uh, uh, an unintended shooting with a two year old is the logical outcome of the exercise of your Second Amendment. Even if those words aren't used, that's the message that gun owners have told me they receive just the way the, the the framing of a story might be. And so what we sought to do was invite uh, Jeff and William and Jair into a conversation where people could see at this event that these gun owners care about this. Their solutions may be different. They may not involve the government, or if they do involve the government, um, there are some unintended consequences that might not be apparent to somebody who doesn't own a firearm in what would be otherwise a well-intended law. Let's stipulate to the intention at the beginning. If it's a well-intended law, you might not appreciate um, what some unintended consequences are of these laws. Did you have any hesitation getting involved in this, given that this 80% coalition is advocating for things like universal background checks, or at least expanded background checks and extreme risk protection orders? You know, I mean, as a journalist, at first, it, I will say when I first saw the lineup, I, I, I thought, OK, well, this is um, sort of a typical event. I've seen other events like this, and I, I'm not taking a position per se, but I sort of am in that I'm inviting in gun owners. And my position is that gun owners have something to add to this from these conversations that I've had in this project. So if there's a position it's that there's another point of view. And that's kind of what I leaned into. As I said, if these individuals are willing to come, I think it can be additive to what to what's happening here. And so rather than shy away, I think of like Mike Sedini from Walk the Talk America. So people in the 2A movement will tell Mike, like, hey, why are you going to meet with Mother's Demand Action or some other groups? Why, why are you doing that? And his point is, uh, at, at, you know, quoting him here, is that he, he said, if I have even 10 percent where we can we might disagree on 90 percent but if there's something we can talk about there's a basis for us to be able to work you know work from there and even if like you say the surprise reveal is that gun owners care and that it is not a this rigid sort of like uh my you know constitutional right usurps 
these bad outcomes. They're different. Maybe the terminology is different, but that right there is a huge thing. And, and I think we saw it in, in the room, and I've heard that feedback from um, uh, people who read the story. And, and it really, actually, in that, in that event, too, I saw a lot of people that I've reported on over the last 20 years around issues of gun deaths, and they pulled me aside and said, I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, and uh, it, it's not a quick turn, but I think that that opening people's eyes to some of this nuance and complexity, it, it's a it's a slow process, but but it's happening. Yeah, I, and I'm glad to see it happen. And you know, I think Mike is absolutely right. Um, there are areas where I think we can find some agreement um, with even gun control advocates. You know, I'm a big believer in effective um, community violence intervention projects, right? Because those are areas that typically don't involve putting any new laws on the books. You're 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 typically focusing on those who are most likely to offend, uh, and maybe those who are already prolific offenders. Um, and that, to me, seems like a very wise approach if you're trying to reduce violent crime. Um, things like the Wisconsin Gunshot Project that you and I have talked about uh, in the past in terms of you know suicide prevention. Uh, without the need for new statutes, without, uh, you know, trying to, in fact, sometimes get in the way of gun owners helping each other. Right. I think those are areas where, at least on paper, Second Amendment supporters and even gun control advocates could say, OK, yeah, we agree that that these things are effective. And then we're going to disagree about, you know, bans on so-called assault weapons, restrictions on concealed carry, things of that nature. I, but, you know, I, I, I guess, do you get the sense in in based on your experiences over the past year, is there an attitude or an appetite for coming together when we can, as opposed to, you know, demonizing uh, gun owners or saying that, you know, if you support uh, expanded background checks, uh, then you're trying to uh, eradicate the second amendment. You know, I think there is an appetite. Um, I, I, I joke sometimes that there are people in the newsroom that, um, you know, these headlines that are nuanced and that seek a path forward might be not as clicky as some of the, you know, sort of like outrage uh, sort of things. But, um, but there is an appetite because I'll, I'll tell you that I think people are tired of feeling like there isn't a path forward in terms of, you know, coming from the edges like, can't we find something to agree on. And the appeal after years of sort of like one edge lobbying at the other edge, there's a lot of people in the middle who I think are more or less have nuanced thoughts about this. And I think this is starting to speak to them. And even if, so the whole basis, you know, of our, because of the way our, our government works with really two parties, it is vital for some piece of compromise to start you know, and, and you think about in Congress that this hasn't happened so much anymore, but there would be that sort of group that would be, um, you know, sort of on the, you know, the middle part of the two parties. And they would seemingly get stuff done together because they trusted each other. And they, that trust is built on I'm coming to the table as a person of goodwill. Um, I, I will be transparent that I disagree with you on this and this and this, but we can talk about this. And to me, that relational capital that starts coming, that trust that starts coming to say, yeah, we're not we're not going to sugarcoat where we disagree. But these are things that we can agree about. That, to me, is where this comes. And I, I, I'll tell you, some people have been very discouraged around issues on, uh, you know, uh, on both sides of this debate or all sides, I would say they're finding um, a refreshing amount of uh, of you know, something to, if it's not the solid hope, it's that, hey, there's something there. Because there's actually a lot that people do agree on, or I should say significantly agree on um, in this area. And that doesn't, it really doesn't get highlighted that much. Yeah, yeah. The, the, you know, I, I will say, I, I don't like the word compromise, because when we are talking about something that implicates what I think is a fundamental right, I don't want to compromise my rights, and I'm not going to compromise my rights. I, I like the term collaboration, right? If you can collaborate on these areas of agreement, then you're not compromising your principles. You're not compromising your rights. You're not sacrificing, uh, you know, something that is uh, vitally important to you, but you are collaborating on a path forward 
in those areas where you agree. And it may be that, you know, with a lot of Second Amendment activists and a lot of gun control activists, there's not a lot of room for agreement. But as you say, even that 10 percent. OK, if there is that common ground, well, why not focus on that? Right. Uh, and move forward in those areas of agreement and then, you know, battle each other in the courts and in the uh, state houses on uh, the 90 percent of the other issues. Um, I, I'd like to think that that's possible. And, you know, maybe through uh, what you're doing with behind the gun, we're we're able to, uh, you know, reach that point where collaboration is at least possible uh, going forward. So. What is your next step here with the Behind the Gun series? What uh, what, what what do you plan on doing in the future? Well, uh, yeah, so the, the training opportunities that I've been talking about have uh, um, continued. The, the requests continue, and we're talking about doing some more uh, events um, like we did in um, the rural part of Wisconsin the, at the intersection of firearms and mental health. Um, there's more discussion around how we could get this message out to different audiences. Like, so this last week we were talking to people, um, you know, more on the gun control side and, and are there ways to get us to be able to uh, present um, among uh, gun rights activists as well to understand a little bit. That's kind of what our WASA event was. And then my latest project, and we're pre-publication, so I have to sort of talk in generalities at this point, but um, I'm really looking at the issue of unintentional uh, gun deaths, um, which are, um, they are uh, heartbreaking, they are preventable, um, and th this actually, I would say, is one of those areas of collaboration around there's a lot of concern that, that is is out there about this these are the least complicated fatal gun deaths because by definition they lack intentionality and therefore they're most intervenable they're mo and, and and the question is how and where but this issue raises so many um uh so much emotion uh, but also, there is a path forward here that, um, again, I couldn't really see before I started the work last year on Behind the Gun. And uh, I, I think there's some ideas here. It would require some collaboration and some some thought. But creatively, I think there's some really interesting stuff that we're going to bring out. And I think there's also some some things that people maybe hadn't thought about with how uh, unintentional firearms, uh, deaths, and injuries, particularly to children, what the costs are that run uh, deeper in, in in society and to the individuals who ultimately end up in the court system because of those shootings. Well, when you uh, are when you've hit publish uh, and that uh, piece has come out, I hope that you'll come back on to talk about it, John. I'd love to come back. Yeah. All right. Listen, uh, again, I, I really appreciate uh, what you're doing. Um, I think that this is a perspective, again, that we don't often see in the media. And I'm glad that uh, you're not only talking to gun owners and, and gun control supporters, but you are talking to journalists as well. Uh, and I hope that they are eating that message. I, I hope that we uh, start to see more nuanced coverage that uh, that takes into account um, the real thoughts and, uh, and opinions of gun owners and Second Amendment supporters. So, John Dieter with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, as always, thanks so much for your time, man. It was great seeing you today. Likewise. Thanks, Cam. My thanks to John for joining us on the program and uh, looking forward to having him back again at some point in the not too distant future. Right now, let's turn our attention to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day and our recidivist report. We will start there with a case out of Michigan. Not not a true recidivist report, but it is one of those. What's going on here? Sentences. Saginaw man pleads guilty to shooting a stranger in the chest at a 7-Eleven. Now, this happened last November. Uh, the uh, individual who uh, was sentenced here, Jermaine T. Williams, or at least who uh, pled guilty, 43 years old, um, apparently bumped into or was bumped into at an ATM on uh, November 4th of last year, about 6.15 in the evening. The uh, 25-year-old who uh, either bumped into him or he bumped into, uh, the pair ended up having a uh, an argument, uh, which resulted in... Uh, the two men fighting for control over the front door of that 7-Eleven. One's on one side of the door, the other's on the other side. Uh, police say at one point, the younger man pushed the door into Williams. Williams then drew a pistol and began firing, chasing the other man around uh, in the parking lot, one of the shots striking the man in the chest. So this was not a case of self-defense. 
this was an aggressive action here, right? Um, amazingly, Williams was able to take a plea deal. So he pled guilty to assault with intent to do great bodily harm. That is a felony punishable by up to 10 years in prison under Michigan law. Uh, in exchange, prosecutors dismissed a uh, offense of assault with intent to murder, which could have resulted in a life sentence, as well as one count of felony firearm. Uh, and according to M. Live, the uh, judge in this case is set to sentence Williams on November 18th uh, and has indicated that he will be sentenced to probation with a tether, quote unquote. So maybe electronic monitoring, you got to, you know, report to your uh, uh, probation officer, but no prison time whatsoever for chasing a man around a parking lot after a, a you know, again, just a civil dispute over something that could have been resolved with a, hey, sorry about that, didn't mean to uh, bump into you. Nothing more than probation when he could have been facing life behind bars. Today's Armed Citizen story from Atlanta, Georgia, where a, a man says he shot and killed an intruder late on Sunday night. We don't have a lot of details, but the Atlanta Journal-Constitution uh, did, uh, actually, I guess this was uh, uh, Channel 2 News in Atlanta, did speak with the uh, armed citizen who said that he and his roommate were watching football with a friend. And he believes at some point the friend told two other guys, hey, knock on the door and then pull a gun. So maybe this was a setup for a home invasion robbery. Two men did show up. The man told the Channel 2, I told them to leave. They left with no contest, but I turned around and there was a barrel of a gun to my face. The man said his roommate then wrestled the intruders to the ground, but the barrel was still pointed at his face. He said uh, they, the intruder and the roommate, separated, and I opened fire in self-defense. The suspect had a gun on his hand and everything. Now, police have not confirmed the uh, uh, armed citizen's version of events, um, but there's no word on any arrests uh, in this case. And if the uh, evidence matches up to the story told by the armed citizen. I'm guessing that no charges will be filed because that would have been a clear-cut case of self-defense. You're where you have every right to be in your own home. Two guys with guns show up. They point a gun at you. You have reasonable cause to believe that your life is in danger. So we'll keep an eye out on any more updates to that, uh, what appears to be a defensive gun use there in Atlanta, Georgia. And finally today, our good deed of the day in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing, a, a stranger to a Lynn County, Oregon man who helped save that resident as well as their dog from a uh, massive house fire that consumed the entire structure. This is Friday morning. The uh, Brownsville Fire District responded to this fire in uh, Brownsville, Oregon. By the time the fire was out, according to KETU, they had used about 50,000 gallons of water. But even before firefighters arrived on scene, a guy named Mylan Unruh of CO, Oregon, just happened to be driving by, and he noticed the smoke. According to the Brownsville Fire Department, Unruh stopped his car, got out, apparently heard a dog barking in an RV that was on the property, ran and got the dog out, and then turned his attention to the home. He thought somebody probably is inside. So according to the Brownsville Fire Department, he body slammed the front door, which was locked, uh, breaking through the front door, and quickly found a resident asleep in a back bedroom. Unruh was able to uh, wake that resident up, help them get out of the home. Unruh was, uh, uh, and, and the uh, uh, homeowner, I guess, both treated for a smoke inhalation, but uh, released a short time later. According to the uh, Brownsville Fire Department, um, this would have been a much more tragic incident if Mr. Unruh did not do what he did. So again, in the right place, at the right time, willing to put his own life at risk to save the life of a stranger i got to say, that is a, a pretty heroic act by uh, Mylon Unruh of uh, CO, Oregon. And we thank you for your very, very good deed. All right, that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you, as always, for being a part of the program. Looking forward to seeing you back here again tomorrow. We are uh, tentatively scheduled to talk with Chuck Michelle, head of the California Rifle and Pistol Association. Hopefully we'll get that to lock down later today. But uh, either way, we will be talking about the latest Second Amendment news and information that matters to you. I'd also encourage you to check out BarionArms.com throughout the day. We're keeping you up to date on all of the latest legislation, litigation, regulation, and the culture war attacks on our right to keep and bear arms. And if you like what you see, also would encourage you to become a VIP, VIP Gold, or VIP Platinum member. Just go to BarionArms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code SAVEAMERICA, and you can get a significant discount on your VIP membership. You'll get all kinds of exclusive access 
great stuff, uh, content you won't find anywhere else, not available to non-subscribers either. But you'll also be supporting the independent pro segment of journalism that we're doing at Barry and Arms. So thank you for that. Have a great rest of your Monday. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free.